Let me just say how thrilled I am to be here. Uh, this is one of the most unique experiences I've had so far, and it's particularly thrilling to be in Copenhagen, Denmark, because your city and your country have enjoyed a rich history of twin research. Dr. Niels Jule Nielsen, who authored a book on twins raised apart in Copenhagen and in Odense, helped develop a twin registry, a national twin registry here in 1954 that was moved to Odense in 1971. So I'm following in some great footsteps. Looking at the title of my talk, Twins Reared Apart from Birth, The Science Behind the Fascination, I want to spend a moment talking about that word fascination. Because many people are fascinated by twins. I hear this all the time, and this room is just overflowing here tonight. But when I ask people, what is it about twins that fascinates you? They're really unable to give me an answer other than to say, because they're just so interesting. So I've thought a lot about why it is that we're so attracted to twins. And I think it's because all of us are raised to expect individual differences in behavior and in appearance. And so when we encounter two people who look so much alike and act so much alike, it challenges our beliefs about the way that the world works. And for some people, that's a very satisfying feeling, but for others, it's disturbing. But regardless, it's intriguing. And I think that's what keeps us so tremendously interested. So tonight, I'm going to talk to you about twins raised apart, how we found them, what they tell us, what it means for all of us. And a lot of these findings come from a book I published in 2012 called Born Together, Reared Apart, the landmark Minnesota twin study. Now, I'll bet that most people here have never seen a reunion between twins. And tonight, you're going to see two. So, Here's the first one, just a bit of background. These little identical girls were separated at birth because of the one-child policy. In China, they were abandoned and found their ways to orphanages or police stations, and adopted separately by a family in Sacramento. That's the girl on your left. And the little girl on your right was adopted by a family living in a tiny little town called Fresvik, Norway. And when the mothers went to pick them up, they noticed that these girls looked remarkably alike, and the mother stayed in touch. And over the years, they decided to do a DNA test, and it turned out the girls were, in fact, identical twins. So they contacted me, and about that time, the BBC was interested in doing a study or a program on something interesting with twins. So I said, well, if you want to reunite these twins, you can get it on camera. They thought it was a great idea. So on June 2nd, 2009, these girls were brought together in Sacramento, California. And let's look at that first meeting. Want me to hold you? So you can be up higher? Okay. <gasps> there they are. Okay, wait, Mia. Careful, Mia. Can you open the door? So these twins are one of 17 pairs that are currently in a project I'm conducting on identical and fraternal twins raised apart in China who are adopted by different families in the US, Canada, Europe. And what's different about this particular study is that I'm following the kids prospectively over time. I get them in the study when they're about three, and I'm now doing 
uh, second year follow-ups on them, which is different than the previous studies of twins raised apart and the Minnesota study, which reunited twins as adults, and so we had to retrospectively recreate their childhood environments. So I think this study will be pretty unique when it's finished. So you've seen a reunion at the young end of the lifespan, and now I'm going to show you a reunion between the pair of twins who've been separated longer than any other pair in the world. You can check the 2016 Guinness Book of Records to see that. These twins were first reunited on May 1st, 2014, in Fullerton, California, at the age of 78. The twin on your left was raised in England, and the twin on your right, while she was also born in England, was brought to the United States and grew up there, thinking that she would never find her twin. The one on the right was raised by her biological mother. The one on the left was adopted out. But when the one uh, on the left had a daughter who was very interested in genealogy, in the course of doing that work, they discovered a twin. And the one in the US had an unlisted telephone number. So it was a very easy reunion to arrange. Here's what it looks like. <laughs> why I love what I do. <laughs> so I was able to fly the British family to the US for the reunion. And each twin came with a child. Of course, these are cousins who had never met each other, and aunts meeting nieces and nephews for the first time. And all four of them took part in a comprehensive uh, medical and psychological assessment, which I've published as a case study. These were fraternal twins, and of course, they were not as alike as the identical twins, but that's good. That tells us that you know, genes do matter. Obviously, we can't make a whole story from a case study, but this is just one more piece of the puzzle. So now let's take a look at the Minnesota study of twins raised apart. And so first, I'll provide you with a brief overview of that study, tell you why March of 1979 was the perfect moment for this study to begin. We'll talk about the findings, the implications, and the controversies. And then I'll give you a little world tour of reared apart twin studies. So the project was a comprehensive psychological and medical assessment of 137 reared apart twins. There were 81, what we call MZA, which stands for monozygotic or identical pairs, and 56 DZA or dizygotic fraternal twin pairs by the time the study was completed. And studying twins raised apart gives you a new dimension to twin research. In other words, the classic method is to compare similarity among identical twins to fraternal twins. And if identicals are more alike, this tells you that the genes make some contribution to that behavior. But you always have to be concerned about the possibility of imitation or some kind of copying between the twins. But with twins raised apart in different environments, that's not a concern. The story was basically, uh, the study was exploratory in nature. We looked at associations between the twins' life history differences, and we looked at the behavioral and physical differences between them. And we generally did not specify hypotheses at the beginning. The study lasted for 20 years, and I was very privileged to be part of it for nine years. I was there from 1982 until 1991, but I stayed involved with it over the years. And in fact, there was so much data because the twins came to the university for an entire week that we're still getting out papers to add to the 170 that already exist. So then, with all these publications out there, why did I write the book? I wrote about it because the study was so comprehensive there were medical measures and psychological measures and all kinds of things that got published in different specialty journals. And many people out there thought we weren't publishing or they thought we'd published one paper when in fact there were many. In addition, there's a tradition of twin raised apart research. 
There was a study in the US in 1937 and a study in England in 1962 and the Danish study in 1965. So I felt that it was important to continue the trend with the book on the Minnesota Project. So when, why, and where did the study begin? March 1979. At that time, the prevailing psychological winds blew mostly from an environmental direction. People were not thinking about genes, they were thinking about environments. And that perspective is summarized in this quote that I'm going to show you in a moment by Walter Michel, who was, is still a very prominent psychologist, not an obscure textbook writer. And his comment really reflected the thinking that was prevalent in psychology at that time. So Michelle wrote, genes and glands are obviously important, but social learning also has a dramatic role. Imagine the enormous differences that would be found in the personalities of twins with identical genetic endowments if they were raised apart in two different families or even more striking in two totally different cultures. So not only does that kind of give a backseat role to genes, but it ignores the study in the US, the study in England, and the study in Denmark all of which found genetic influence on personality. So why was there this resistance to genetics? We can look at some historical and societal events for answers. You had the Nazi legacy from 1945 onward, the idea of trying to show that some people had genetic superiority over others, and to do that by just simply horrific medical experiments at Auschwitz and in other concentration camps. You had the women's movement in the 1960s that called for equality of males and females in educational settings and in the workplace. And the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in the US that ad law discrimination based on race or ethnicity. In academic circles, you had Arthur Jensen who authored an article in the Harvard Educational Review in 1969, a huge article on genetics and intelligence. But when he wrote a page or two about the possibility, not the conclusion, but the possibility that perhaps genes might explain black-white differences because the black-white average difference in IQ was 15 points. This is what got the attention and really made doing research in this area quite difficult. Cyril Burt, a British educational psychologist, published a series of three raised apart twin studies in the 70s. And someone discovered that with every increase in his sample size, he had the same exact correlation, 0.771, which is just impossible to get three separate times. And there was some discrediting of his work. His work is no longer cited in the literature. But it does not detract in any way because we had all those other previous findings and the ones that came afterwards. And by the way, it's been shown by two independent historians of science that Burt did, do in did in fact do these studies. And then you had the famous evolutionary biologist Edward Wilson from Harvard, who wrote a book on sociobiology. And in his last chapter, he talked about the possibility of human social organization being influenced by genetic factors. And when he talked about this at the AAAS meetings, he had water thrown in his face. So anyone who dappled in this area of genes and behavior took a huge academic risk. On the other hand, there were other trends going on in the field. You had the Garcia effect from the 1950s and 60s, the idea that you could train rats to avoid food that was linked to nausea, but you could not train them to avoid food linked to loud noises, suggesting some constraints on behavior. There were other non-human animal studies showing that you could breed rats to be maize dull or maize bright. Various gene behavior relationships were being discovered. The idea that an extra chromosome 21 led to Down syndrome, and there was a genetic defect linked to phenylketonuria. You had cognitive psychology on the rise, the development of computer-based uh, models of how the brain works. And then you had some studies in behavior genetics, twins and adoption, that led to the association in the journal and the formation of the International Society for Twin Studies in 1974. So all these currents were going on at roughly the same time. And to quote my colleague, Matt McHugh, he said there was just enough doubt about the primacy of the environment to enable the Minnesota study of twins raised apart to come into being in March of 1979. 
So now you're going to meet the first pair of twins that actually launched the study. And this is the first pair of topless hairy males I'm going to show you tonight. So these guys, the Jim twins, Jim Lewis and Jim Springer, were separated at birth and grew up in different towns in Ohio. And when there was a search done by the family for the other one, they were reunited at the age of 39. And the Jim twins got a lot of publicity. They were in newspapers around the country and around the world. They were similar in the sense that besides their same names, they both had dogs named Toy, and they both were part-time carpenters, both part-time sheriffs, both named their sons James Allen, both thought it was funny to scatter love notes around the house. Both worked as sheriffs and at McDonald's. I mean, the list goes on. And they also suffered from these unusual mixed headache syndromes. So they had many, many similarities. Dr. Thomas Bouchard, a psychologist at the University of Minnesota, decided he would invite them to the campus, put them through a comprehensive test battery, and maybe, just maybe, find a few other pairs. But what happened was that the Jim twins were so popular and so similar that it attracted other pairs to the project. So when he had seen 15 sets, he decided he would keep going. But the University of Minnesota was a very special place for a lot of reasons. They had a long history of individual differences research, which let the project keep going. And you needed colleagues who were interested, and they were there. You had. Irvin Gottesman, very famous in the field of psychopathology, and who had actually done some twin studies in personality. You had the late Dr. David Licken, who had done studies in physiological variables. You had Alcatelligan, a professor of psychology who had worked with Licken on personality studies. Now, another unique feature of the University of Minnesota is that the medical school is right there on the campus. In many universities, it's downtown in a neighbor, terrible neighborhood, but it was right there on the campus, so we could collaborate with the doctors. And that brought in Dr. Leonard Hestern, who, aside from being a father of twins, had done twin studies on homosexuality and adoption studies on schizophrenia, and Dr. Elka Eckert, who was very interested in eating disorders. So you had a whole research team right there, and then you had graduate students and people who took lesser roles in the project. So as I suggested a moment ago, it was a rather simple step to go from the Jim twins to the Minnesota study of twins raised apart. The Jims were strikingly similar, attracting attention. There was considerable press coverage, and that led to the identification of new pairs of twins. So how did we find them? The US, unlike Denmark, did not have a twin registry, and we still don't have one. So we had to rely on other methodologies media reports, adoption services, referrals from colleagues, and referrals from the twins themselves, and some previous twin participants. So we were able to get this collection of cases, not really a systematically gathered sample, but a collection of cases. And what we always did was to make sure our twins were not aberrant in any way, that they didn't show some unusual behaviors relative to twins who were raised together. When we began the study, you can see that we had many more twins in the beginning, 14, 12. We found them maybe 10 or 12 a year, and that began to dwindle off as the project began. And so we assumed that we just ran out of twins and we found all the rear apart twins there were. But the internet and social media were not used so much in those days the way they are now. And there have been explosions of twins finding each other I can't tell you how many case reports I keep on doing, like the Chinese twins and those older twins from England and the US. So if, if the internet had been in place in those days, I think we probably could have been going a lot longer. But we were completely wrong about the sample drying up. So what did our twins look like at the time we were done with the study? There were 156 identical uh, individuals and, and 106 fraternals. The mean age for the identicals was about 40 and fraternals 45. Now, the fraternals were older by about six, seven years. I suspect the reason is that it takes fraternal twins longer to find each other because they don't look alike. They have to rely on adoption records or reports from relatives or what have you. 
Whereas many of our identical twins met just because they looked alike and were confused by other people. So they have an easier time finding one another. And that's why I think we have more of them than fraternals because that's the flip of the population distribution. In the population, there are many more fraternals than identicals. We had more identicals because I think they had an easier time finding one another. When you look at how long they were together before separation, the identicals together 81, I'm sorry, 146 days, the fraternals 322. That's very important because twin research is not without its critics. And we had some pretty tough critics out there who said that how long you are together is linked to how similar you are. Well, take a look at this. The fraternal twins were together longer, and yet they were much less alike than the identical twins were. And this last slide shows you that the identicals met at the age of 31, the fraternals at 42. And again, I think that's because the fraternal twins had a harder time finding one another than did the identicals. So now let's take a look at a couple of selected twin pairs. And here comes the second pair of topless hairy males. <laughs> I think they're in hairier than the first ones. So these twins are Jerry and Mark, identical twins raised apart in different cities in New Jersey, who met each other purely by chance at the age of 32. The way they met, they're both volunteer firefighters. And Every year in New Jersey, they hold a volunteer firefighters convention to which one twin met, went. But the buddies of the other one went and they recognized him and asked about his birthday and what is he adopted. And then one thing led to another and they were, adopt, they were reunited without any knowledge of ever having been a twin. Now what's fascinating about them is the way they're holding their beers, right? Now these are Budweiser, not Carls, Carlsberg or Tuborg. I apologize for that, but that's their favorite beer and they hold it with a pinky finger underneath the can, right? Why is that? We don't have the answer to that question, but when you see these kinds of quirks repeated in identical twins, and less so in fraternals, it gives you a whole new doma domain for thinking about why we do things the way that we do. It could be that that's how their hands felt comfortable, or maybe they're so afraid of, of spilling the precious liquid. Maybe they're a little neurotic about that. We don't know but at least it makes us think about things. And you know, many of us have our own little quirks, admit it, and some of us think that we probably got it because we imitated someone at home. But in fact, you probably weren't imitating them. It was probably your genes that were driving those similarities. So here's another pair of twins, Jack and Oscar, who are also identical twins raised apart who met for the first time when they were 20. And they probably have the most dissimilar set of rearing circumstances of any twin pair that we studied. By the way, am I in anybody's way here? Can you see? Or should I move over here? Everything's all right? Great. Okay, so Jack, who's the twin on your, well, first of all, these twins were born in Trinidad in 1933 to a Jewish father who had left Romania and a Catholic mother who had left Germany. And after the parents had the boys, they were six months old and the marriage soured so Jack stayed in Trinidad to be raised Jewish by his father, and Oscar went back with his mother to be raised Catholic in Nazi Germany. So you can imagine the different political and historical impact that their rearing environments had on them. What's fascinating about these twins, and there's so many fascinating things about them, but each one was afraid that the people in their country would discover their roots. Jack worried that people would discover his German roots, so he became very pro-British. And Oscar was afraid somebody would discover his Jewish roots, so he became very pro-German. And that's how they handled these things, different content but similar strategies. And they met for the first time at 20, after, Os after Jack had worked on the kibbutz part-time and then came to Germany to visit Oscar. And it was a very cold reunion. They, they could not see eye to eye on anything, and they could hardly speak the same language. So they separated. Oscar stayed in, in Germany, Jack went to California. And then they heard about the Minnesota study of twins raised apart when they were in their 40s. And they decided to give it another try. They were not in touch, but the wives stayed in touch. <laughs> and so we flew Jack and Oscar together to Minnesota to meet for the first time. And they had a long list of similarities too. They showed up at the airport wearing the same glasses and the same shirts. 
and they scored similar IQs, and they had similar personalities, and they both thought it was funny to sneeze loudly in elevators, and they, <laughs> they used to wear rubber bands around their wrists, and they, if you were having dinner with them and there was a vase in between the flower, they'd shove it aside. And they, they did many, many things in common. But the most fascinating thing to me is that they had a conversation, and they said, we know that if our positions had been switched, we each would have grown up embracing the opinion that we currently despise. And that just really emphasizes the importance of context, that our identity is grounded in uh, contingencies that are context dependent. So Jack would have been pro-German and Oscar would have been probably pro-Israel. Very fascinating to think about that. This is the only pair of fraternal twins we had that met through mistaken identity, and I think you can see why because their facial contours are very similar. And they both have an inherited hair disorder. It's actually a skin disorder, but it affects the hair as well. It's um, hyperplasia where the hair does not grow. That's as long as it gets. And the twin on your right actually passed it down to two of her three children. They met in the state of Vermont when one twin moved to the other one's hometown, and people were confusing her all the time to the point where she took a closer look and, and realized that they had she had a twin sister. And these twins from New Zealand, Arrow and Iris, met for the first time at the age of 75, and they held the Guinness Book of Records for a long time until the two twins that I showed you about <coughs> earlier who met at the age of 78. Now, it's important that we studied fraternal and opposite sex twins as well, because some of the early studies were criticized for only studying identicals, which meant that if they thought a pair might be fraternal, they wouldn't take them, and so you'd be excluding the dissimilar identicals. We took all twins, so we had a more representative collection of cases than the other studies did. So let's look at the findings, the implications, and the controversies from this project, and I'd love to start this out with this cartoon from The New Yorker, and I am convinced that our study inspired this cartoon. It's from the late Charles Adams, and it says, Separated at birth, the Malifer twins meet accidentally. And you can see that you've got two identical twins there. Um, they've got the same tennis shoes. They're outside the patent attorney's office with similar inventions and eyeglasses around their, their necks. And our twins were not this similar. Yes, they were very similar, more so than any other pair of people, but this was a bit of an exaggeration. Nevertheless, came out in 1981, two years after the project began, I'm sure I know where he got his, his ideas from. So what I'm going to do is show you a selected sampling of findings, and I'm going to take you chronologically through the study as we progressed. So here, very early on, we studied psychiatric traits in maybe 26 of the twin pairs. And what you can see is that the twins seem to be quite similar within pairs. Uh, the first pair had fears and phobias, and some adjustment problems. The second pair had speech problems and some emotional abilities problems. There were some differences in severity, but nevertheless, the general symptoms were very highly matched. And when we gathered more twins and gave them more comprehensive diagnostic interview surveys, we began to see some genetic trends emerging. On the first day of the study, we had all the twins stand, and we took unposed photographs of them. And what we inevitably saw was that the identical twins would fall into similar body postures than the fraternal twins would. And it's an interesting thing because we, we tend, I tend to think that how we stand, how we move, how we gesture is, again, imitation of the people around us. But these scenarios suggest that it's not. And as I look around the auditorium, I see people slouching, I see hands folded, I see feet up in the air, I see all kinds of things here. And it's probably because your body's more comfortable in certain positions based upon how your body's put together. And if you had an identical twin, they'd probably be sitting the same way that you are. We studied sexual orientation. We had a small twin sample, so we did not expect to get a high number of twins who were gay, but we did get some. And we had two monozygotic reared apart male twins. In one pair, both twins were gay. In the other pair, it was uncertain because the one twin had had some homosexual affairs and then married and had children, so we were never quite sure how to classify him. Uh, 
With our four females, there were no concordant pairs. It was four females where one was gay, the other was not. So what we suggested from this, this is a very small number, so we made just a suggestion that homosexuality or sexual orientation has a higher genetic component in males than it does in females. And we were just raked over the coals with that. It was just a suggestion. But I have to say that the best big study I've seen, population-based, came out in 2010 from Sweden and showed exactly the same thing. The Minnesota study had 170 papers, as I told you. But there are two that I consider to be really pivotal, that really had a large impact on the field and on the thinking of many, many colleagues. And the first one was a study of personality, published in 1988. And it was the first four-group study, meaning it had identical twins raised apart and together, and fraternal twins raised apart and together. Now, for anyone here who does research, there's a story behind every paper. But you don't see it when it's in the journal. But if you've done the study, you know the story. So I'll tell you the Daniel Goleman story. So Daniel Goleman was a New York Times reporter. And he was just dying to get his hands on this data and write about it. And we said, you can't because it has to be in a peer-reviewed journal before you can put it into the general media. Anyway, he persisted, and somebody in our public relations office convinced Dr. Licken, who was one of our research team, to send him the paper. So it was in the press before it was in the scientific journal, and that was a bit of a problem for a while. Anyway, Goldman wrote, the genetic makeup of a child is a stronger influence on personality than child rearing, according to the first study to examine identical twins reared in different families. The findings shatter a widespread belief among experts and laymen alike in the primacy of family influence and are sure to engender fierce debate. So there's a lot that's wrong with that. Uh, first of all, we were not the first study. We were the fourth. And also, we didn't say that, that rearing does not matter. Rearing matters a lot. Parents have very important responsibilities to be sensitive to the child's tendencies and personalities and interests and talents. It's just that the environment does not work in the way that we think it does. Um, rearing with somebody does not make you alike. And that's shown in this next slide. So it's a little bit bright here, but what you can see in the bar graphs is that the identical twins, raised, whether raised apart or together, were just about as alike in personality. Uh, they, were, they were similar to one another in personality. So it wasn't as if the reared aparts were less alike. They were as like as they were together, which shows that a sharing environment does not affect personality development. And that's mirrored in these fraternals who show less similarity, but nevertheless the same degree of resemblance. So we didn't exactly say what Goldman was accusing us. Many people said, you're saying the child ring doesn't matter. We never said that. There's a whole other 50% of personality variation we have to account for. That's accounted for by the environment, but not the shared environment. It's the unique environment that we experience apart from our family members, such as having an unusual professor, or reading a great book, or taking a great trip, the things that you experience uniquely apart from your family members. Our second pivotal paper was published in the journal Science in 1990. And this was a study of IQ resemblance in our twins raised apart. And this one also has a story. It's the Daniel Koshland story. Daniel Koshland was the editor of the journal Science, which is the most prestigious scientific publication there is. And he had met Professor Bouchard, the study's director, several years before this was published. And they had talked about twin studies, and he was very interested. And then some years passed, and Daniel Koshland called up the study and said that he would like an IQ paper in six weeks. And Bouchard said, I can't do it in six weeks. And Koshland said, do you know who you're talking to? And Bouchard said, oh yes, the editor of science. And we'll have a paper in six weeks. And we did. And here are the findings. We summarized all the findings from the different studies that have been done, the one in the US, Denmark, and England. And you can see that despite the different populations, different investigators, 
different countries and different tests. The resemblance is pretty similar. It's a pretty robust finding. Our study was pretty similar as well, and the study that followed in Sweden was also pretty similar. So the average was about 0.73. What that means is that the individual differences among us in general ability are about 70% genetically influenced, leaving the other 30% to the environment. It does not mean that people can't improve, study harder, get better, learn more. It does mean that we probably all can't be the same. But I think we probably know that anyway. Now, there were some surprises, I have to say. Uh, religiosity, that is, not your affiliation, but the extent to which you engage in religious activities and lead a religious type of life, had been studied in the past with twin studies, and a genetic component had not been found. Suddenly, we began to find it in the reared apart twins. And I think the reason is that we studied older twins who were no longer under the guidelines of their family, who were free to pick and choose, so their genetic potentials are more free to be expressed. And that's shown in this slide here, which is also a four-group design. So you can see that for twins raised together, about 0.6 for leisure time, occupational interests, but doesn't differ that much for the twins raised apart, and then the fraternals reared together a little more alike, but the reared apart's quite dissimilar. So even something like religiosity has a genetic influence, and it's not as if there's a gene for being religious, but it's probably grounded in many, many different genes. It's a complex behavior grounded in personality, intelligence, and various sensitivities. This is a pair of our twins, Debbie and Sharon, who nicely illustrate this point. They were raised apart until 45. And Sharon, who's on your left, was raised in a fairly strict Catholic home, and Debbie on your right was raised in a fairly strict Jewish home. And they both had younger siblings also adopted who were not religious at all, despite the family rearing. And when these two met, they understood each other's interest in religion. And they both began to attend each other's house of worship. And then they thought to themselves, maybe we should change our religion or one of us should so it would be the same. And they both independently decided they didn't want to. And when they realized that, they gained a new respect for the other one because they felt if they changed, that meant you weren't really part of that. So the fact that they were thinking so much alike, I think, is, is quite revealing. So is happiness, well-being, is that genetically influenced? It is. And in another four-group design, we find that identical twins raised apart actually show greater similarity than identical twins raised together, and the fraternals very, very little similarity. Dr. David Licken, who authored this study, also showed that what he called the happiness set point seems to be genetically influenced. Now think about your own sort of general level of happiness as I go through this. We all have a characteristic level of being happy. Certainly, good fortune, winning the lottery, getting an A in a paper, makes you feel happy. Or losing your wallet or losing a loved one makes you unhappy. But generally, you will drift back to this sort of general characteristic level of functioning. And that also seems to be genetically influenced. And that's important because there are some unhappy or depressed people that go through therapy for years and never seem to get better. And perhaps this makes them understand why. Or perhaps there's another therapy they should try, a different, different type. But at any rate, I think this gives us answers to questions that we didn't have previously. Now, when I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, my first twin study, which was my dissertation, was on twin relationships. I was fascinated by them. Um, I didn't mention this, and it wasn't in the introduction, but I'm a fraternal twin. I have a twin sister who looks and acts nothing like me. So I was always fascinated with twins from a very, very early age. And I was very jealous of these identical twins I knew in school who seemed to get along so well and be so close, and my sister and I weren't enemies at all, but we were just so uninvolved. We had our own sets of friends and interests and things of that sort. And so I began to systematically study twin relationships when I was at the University of Chicago, and with the study of twin children, showed that identicals are much more cooperative and altruistic toward one another when they're engaged in joint activities than fraternal twins were. But I wondered what this would look like for twins raised apart. So I put together 
a comprehensive survey, and there were a couple of questions I was really interested in looking at. And that was, when I met my twin for the first time, I felt we would become closer than best friends, as close as best friends, on down to less close than most people I meet for the first time. And I repeated that question in terms of how familiar do you feel when you first met, and how familiar and close do you feel now? And then, at the last minute, I stuck in a question about how close do you feel now to the adoptive siblings you were raised with? Because after all, these separated twins are mostly adoptees raised with unrelated people who had either biological kids in the family or other adoptees, but regardless, they're not going to be related. So I find the results pretty spectacular. So first, about 80% of the identicals said that they currently feel more familiar or, more, uh, or close than best friends, which drops down a bit for fraternals, which mirrors what you see in identical fraternal twin relationships. But what I find the most interesting is what you see for the adoptive sibling. These are the twins rating adoptive siblings, and only 20 to 30 percent felt closer or more familiar at the current time. And this is kind of striking because these are people they've known all their lives. They've just met their twin, and yet they feel so much more connected socially. And I think that what drives this difference is that with the twins, especially the identicals, this perception of similarity is what drives the attraction and maintains the relationship. It happens to a lesser degree in fraternals and, and probably not much at all with the adoptive siblings. It's kind of like you know, if you're traveling in a foreign country and you, you meet somebody from your hometown, you feel a kind of kinship. It's kind of along those lines, this perception of similarity. And remember, these are twins who were raised in, in unrelated homes where they never looked like anybody. And I think maybe, maybe that added to the attraction. I don't know that for sure. But what it does show is that shared time, in terms of length, does not necessarily predict a close relationship. And you don't have to be together a long time in order to have one. So what are the implications from this project? One is that genetic influence is pervasive. It affects many more behaviors than we ever would have imagined. Shared environments do not make relatives alike. And it's the non-shared unique environments that are most relevant to behavioral development. Everyone can improve. Everyone cannot be the same. And of course, there are individual exceptions. People raised in overwhelming environments, great uh, deprivation that will overwhelm genetic potential. In terms of parenting, I always tell parents that if you have one child, you're an environmentalist. And if you're the parent of two, you become a geneticist overnight. Because you may think that what you do is having a certain effect. And it might be. But child two comes along, and it's just not working. And these kids are totally different. In fact, I find that the, the experts on human behavior are parents of fraternal twins. They really are, because they have two age-matched kids who are going through life at the same time, and yet the kids can be totally different. It's parents' responsibility of staying sensitive to each child's talents and dispositions. And family members are similar and dissimilar due to genetic factors. So where is the future of reared apart twin studies going? You know, some people think that behavior genetics is now moving totally to molecular studies. And in many ways, it is. People are interested in linking specific genes to specific behaviors. They're interested in epigenetic analysis, that is, gene expression, what causes the gene to turn on or to turn off. In identical twins, they may differ, for example, in genetically influenced conditions, like diabetes, like multiple sclerosis, like breast cancer. So why don't they both have it? Something in the environment triggers it in one twin or keeps it quiet in the other. And people are focusing now on what are called endophenotypes or internal phenotypes. That is, how do we go from the gene at the molecular level to the behavior we see in everyday life? Maybe there's some process in between that we need to look at. Um, we mentioned phenylketonuria earlier, and that's the condition where there's an accumulation of phenylalanine in the brain, which causes mental retardation if you don't go on a phenylalanine-free diet. So we know that we have the gene, and then we have the, the mental retardation if it's unchecked. But in between, you have this endophenotype, which is the metabolic problem. So given all that, I often ask myself, what if the gym twins were found today? Would anybody care? 
And I think they would, but not in the way that we studied them. I think they'd be more interested in looking at what genes they had and what genes were linked to their mixed headaches and things of that sort. But there still is a place for weird apart twin studies the, the way we did them. And in fact, my study of Chinese twins is very much in that tradition because no one's ever done a study prospectively on young separated twins. And there are behaviors that have never been looked at enough. What about love styles? There's been one study on love styles on how quickly or slowly you fall in love. Found no genetic influence, which surprises me a lot. That's an area that needs some work. So I'll just tell you quickly about some of my other projects. This is the Chinese twin study, the reared apart perspective uh, project. Has 10 identical twin pairs and seven fraternals. The children have a mean age of about six and a half, but I get them as young as three and as old as 15. I'm still looking for subjects if anybody knows any. And the mean age of adoption is about one, but it ranges from about a half a year until a little bit over two. So I'm still gathering data. I've only published one paper on this project so far, and that was on the nature of the twins' first meetings with each other, as reported by the parent. And I wasn't able to organize it by identical paternal because I didn't have enough cases. But what the mothers did say is that the twins just got together so beautifully that even if their child was a little shy and didn't get along with kids, something about that twin was like magic. And, and that is very fascinating to me. Um, it's something I'm going to be following up as the study progresses. Some of you may have heard about these two twins, Samantha and Anis, because their video went viral. So just briefly, they were born in South Korea and adopted separately, Anis by a family in France and Samantha by a family in the US in New Jersey. And then Samantha moved to Los Angeles to become an actress. And she posted a YouTube video, and it was seen by one of Anise's friends in France who said, my God, you look exactly like my friend. And they began a Facebook exchange and conversation, and they finally met in London. Now, they were trying to raise money from Kickstarter to start a movie about their lives, and someone forwarded this to me. And to tell you the truth, I was horrified. Why was I horrified? <coughs> because we didn't know for sure they were twins. They hadn't done a DNA test, and they could have been a rare pair of lookalikes. I've dealt with two such cases like that so far, and I was worried that they would end up like that, and then nobody would want to see the movie. So, um, <laughs> so I called them up and I said, look, I study twins, I'm in Fullerton, I'm an hour from you, let's get this DNA test done. So we did it. And what they did was they made a movie that is just spectacular. It's on Netflix if you've got it. It's called Twinsters, which is a contraction between twins and sisters, Twinsters. And in the movie, you see me telling them that they're identical. And they're on the other end in London drinking wine and celebrating. It's, it's just a wonderful, wonderful moment. So that's something you should see. Now, we did put them through a fairly comprehensive uh, test battery. And here I've plotted their profile of abilities on the general intelligence test. And you can see that while the US twin did slightly better, the profile of their patterns, strengths, and weaknesses is very highly matched. And in personality, across 37 different personality traits, with just a couple of exceptions, maybe over here and over here, they follow amazingly similar profiles, raised in two totally different cultures. Okay, so we've gone to the US, we've gone to China, South Korea. How about South America? <laughs> so this is the latest thing I'm working on. This is the Bogota Twins Project. I'm doing it in collaboration with Jessica Montoya, who's a social worker from Columbia, but at Columbia University in New York. And so just briefly, there back uh, about 26 years ago, there was a pair of identical twins, boys, born in Bogota, and another pair of boys born a day earlier in La Paz, Colombia, in the municipality of Santander. One of the little boys in Santander was extremely sick at birth, and he needed much better medical care than he could get in Santander. So his grandmother brought him by bus at the age of one day, 
to the hospital in Bogota where these other twins were born. And she left him there for a week, and it was decided that the twins' aunt, who lived in Bogota, would return him to La Paz. It was a crowded nursery, things were chaotic, and when the aunt received the baby to take home, she received one of the twins in the other pair. So you had a situation of two sets of unrelated brothers who looked exactly the same. Two replications of the same unrelated pair. I call these sets of individuals virtual twins. That's another study I do. I study children who are adopted together who are the same age as a way of testing the environment. But this is an unusual case of virtual twins because these are virtual twins who think they're fraternal twins. And no one ever suspected that they weren't. After all, both mothers gave birth to twins and twin type wasn't a big deal and they both knew they had boys. So that's what happened. All right, so now let's, let's fast forward 25 years. The La Paz boys move to Bogota and they become butchers. They work in a butcher shop way across town. Bogota is a huge city, way across town from the other guys. And a co-worker of one of the Bogota boys was having a barbecue, and she had a friend whose cousin worked in the butcher shop. So they go across town to get a, some cheap meat, and she sees this guy a, a, across the counter, and she says, what are you doing here? And he says, you know, Jorge, says, no, I'm William, I'm not Jorge. And they go back and forth, and she just doesn't understand it. So she takes a picture of him, and she shows it to her friend the next day at work, and everybody has a big laugh about this, oh, look alike. But the, the situation kind of rested for a while, but it began to resurface, and the two friends kind of couldn't let, leave it alone for a while. So they, they talked to this guy in Bogota, and he went on Facebook eventually, and what he found was quite interesting. He found himself in clothes he didn't own in a place he'd never been, but next to him was a guy who looked exactly like his fraternal twin brother, but wasn't his brother. <laughs> So then they began to get very, very scared. <laughs> and they, they had to meet and figure out what happened, and they did. They all met one evening, and they just, I mean, they exploded in laughter, but they, they had some difficult moments because one set of parents had been deceased, so one twin would never meet his biological mother or father. The environments were dramatically different. Bogota, a rich cultural city, lots of educational opportunities, which those twins were pursuing. Both were getting master's degrees. In, Bo in La Paz, fifth grade, that's it. So not only did we have two sets of reared apart twins, we had different environments, which is what my colleagues have been clamoring for. So let's look at the twin and non-twin pairings of these brothers so you get a, s a better idea of who's reared with whom, because I'll tell you, it's complicated. All right, so here we have, born in Bogota, Jorge and William, okay, identical twins. And here we have Carlos and Wilbur, born in Santander, also identical twins. Okay, everybody with me? Okay, now, after the switch, you've got Jorge and Carlos growing up together and William and Wilbur, okay? So two sets of reared apart twins, but there's one more I can do. I can switch Carlos and Wilbur so I can get these two who are like the ones reared together, but they show no environment either. So I can compare them with the one he shared the environment with. And I can do that in the reverse for the other pair. So it's a very, very rich set of comparisons. It's really hard to keep straight. But we put them through a very comprehensive battery, all kinds of tests, which I don't have time to go into now. But You'll be able to read about this in probably a year and a half because I'm working on a book called Accidental Brothers, Doubly Exchanged Twins, The Lives They Led and Lost. And in closing, this is my last slide, I want to leave you with this thought which comes from my book Born Together, Reared Apart. It's a quotation from the director. Twin studies refute both biological and environmental determinism. They do not negate the effect of the environment on behavior, nor do they overglorify the role of genes. They account for the uniqueness of each of us. Thank you very much. <laughs>